So to be spiritual, you're trying to open yourself to an idea that this moment is my master. The sensitivity to the energy in my heart, in my blood, it's actually guiding and telling me something. I often believe the reason why the Creator Field became Mahadev and Lord Krishna the Bhagavan and so we people who weren't ready to focus on the formless, we had an image in our head that we could focus on and perceive that same blessing, that same energy, that same power and hold it in. When you start to see God in everybody, when you start to see God in everything, everything becomes divine, you know, like every single thing becomes divine. Even suffering becomes divine if you start seeing God in that. A Sankarshan Joshi trip. We finally have you here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another Sankarshan Joshi trip. This trip is going to be quite a journey because the man we have on this podcast is a really, really, really interesting man. So we have Arjun Man on the podcast. So Arjun, this is the first time uh, we have you on the podcast. So could you please give a tiny bit background about yourself and context to this podcast? Uh, like why we're doing this from your perspective you know because uh, it's your first time here would you do the honors absolutely so my name is Arjun as my brother just said I grew up here in California I've always been sensitive to my own body and in the world and I use the moment to give me an understanding of where I am and where everyone else is so thanks to eastern culture and philosophy I've decided to really just allow myself to find my flow in whatever I'm doing, whether it's eating my food, talking to my friends, working with the horses, working out, just allowing that flow to move with whatever activity I'm in. <laughs> and as I realize, that's what everyone can benefit from, you know, because we can all learn to be happy just sitting down or doing the job that we're doing and just allowing that to be the situation instead of fighting it and being like, I want this, I want that. No, just sit there and feel yourself inside right now in the second and realize that this moment can give you everything. More than even the future can in a moment, you know? Absolutely. You know what's interesting about whatever you said so far? It's like to give context to people, the way how we started talking is very, very, very strange, right? Like, uh, so you are the second person that I've uh, built a connect connection and friendship with after the Shredded Farmers podcast. So I did an episode with someone called Dan and uh, he also hosts a podcast like Quest for Cimmeria and he's also very spiritually curious. I am spiritually curious and even our conversation also, like we started talking to each other on Instagram, right? I think that is something we both have in common is that we are very spiritually curious, you know, like we're trying to make sense of things. And when we started talking to each other, I'm like, like, holy shit, like we both, uh, we, we are not crazy, you know, <laughs> like we can have a same conversation about uh, like spirituality, very, very, very curious things. And so it's so interesting how you have built your relationship with the God or like Shiva or like how you started your entire uh, journey and your quest for the truth or like spirituality, right? Like, so there is this, uh, with spirituality, it's a fat terminology right now. So that's why I think twice or thrice before using it because I don't know. How I understand. I feel the same way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It almost seems like we're being colonized when we use the word because, <laughs> you know, it's a different word. It came from the Victorian era. And a lot of it was through appropriating either our culture or an Asian one or an indigenous one and taking bits that don't always go well together, you know. So I understand exactly what you're saying. I guess it's beautiful that we can know this and realize, hey, maybe the intent behind this person using it is for something good, positive, because we could just vibe into it and check in. You know, I think one of the reasons why people who are spiritually inclined right now feel like they can be seen as crazy by the mainstream society is we're living in a world that isn't always teaching people to be authentic to who they are. They're teaching you, hey, you should care what other people think, what, what other people say, you know, this kind of mentality. Or, you know, it's very much like if you share something about being relaxed and profound, the other person, he might not want to hear it because he's not doing great right now. 
So a lot of times when spiritual brothers or sisters, they fight each other, no matter what nation, tribe, heritage they're from, they're synchronizing on this heart level from their heart expanding and opening to these vibrations. So to be spiritual, you're trying to open yourself to an idea that this moment is my master. The sensitivity to the energy in my heart, in my blood, it's actually guiding and telling me something. It's not something I need to dull out and forget. It's actually very wise. It's even older than me. It's something my old ones they used to be able to tune into and listen. And it would get the wisdom to create everything we've seen, you know, medicine, you know, buildings, weapons, martial arts, relationships, just understanding how the human subconscious works. So it's very beautiful and true, you know. I do actually believe that the more we go into the future on a conscious level, people who have this yearning to flow into the moment, find what creation feels to them, no matter where to come from, they will start coming together more and more in a very respectful acknowledgement of each other's space from which they exist, you know. Right, right. Where did it all begin for you? So on our previous call and even on the chat we talked about like we had a conversation about shiva as well right like you have a very special inclination towards him and where did this all begin like your quest if i may call that when i was younger when i was like 2 and 3 i used to have a dream about a woman in a red indian suit she would hug me pick me up out of my crib And then I remember when I could finally speak it in the words I would talk to my mom about this and she kind of would cry a little bit cuz she would tell me you know this is my mother she passed away when I got married and you are seeing her and I was asking her more about her and I kind of just put it off for a few years like you know this sounds nice <laughs> but afterwards you know it kind of made me more curious because I started being curious about the sensations in my body not from a hormonal point of view but just like how the air would feel at certain times how talking to a person kind of feel very tense or very relaxed and flowing so from an early youth i started having this hypersensitivity now what happened was i got diagnosed with autism aspergers to be exact the doctors put me on medications so for a long time these gifts they were very dulled up while i was having very strong deja vu now when i say deja vu brother i mean I will have these images in my head not like a premonition. No, don't think that. It would be like a, exactly like it would be an image of something in my head, right? And then a feeling behind it. Now either something very good will happen or something kind of sucky will happen. Or I guess I shouldn't call it that, it's something like a learning moment. So for a very long time this crystalis it was stopped and I couldn't really relate into it due to the western medication. As I got older and I was started working through more trauma I started thinking, you know, this stuff the doctors just giving me is not helping, so I got to find my own stuff, my own wisdom and that knowledge and information. And one of my friends, you know, he was a Rastafarian, so he was like telling me about getting off the medication, going more towards herbs. And after this, I started, you know, really working with plant medicine, plant energy, like burning sage because in California we're around a lot of indigenous people. So I started burning sage, I started you know giving thanks to the elements and the creator field and uh my do tradition around where i live they would say that the earth was made by a world maker a creator being this formless being that we cannot say but he comes into deities and different tribes different cultures so it was a very nice open place for me to start thinking about my own culture and spirituality after that i started seeing different things from the ceremonies one time we were sitting together during this calling back the salmon ceremony and there were these fish and they were coming up to the river they were cuz the medicine man he was speaking maidu so these fish their ancestors they probably remember hearing this man speak maidu you know or hearing the language and they're listening them speak this language they're coming up their head in the water and they're listening them speak the language and it was so beautiful and i kept wishing to connect more and more to my ancestors So I went into an Incan ceremony with the Keros. Kero Indians, they live in the Andes. So when Cortez and the conquistadores came, they had a vision that the first man with the gray beard, he wasn't the savior, but he was the destroyer and they had to run away from him. So they went into this very high point in the Andes, so high most people can't survive or breathe in because it's so hard to live up there. 
They chew cocoa leaves just to keep their lungs strong in this kind of environment, if you'll imagine. So these guys, they have really spectacular health, even though they'll smoke or drink or stuff. And it's very interesting. They don't do it in an abusive way, but they are such good shape, such good health, and their language is fully intact. So during the ceremony, while we were sitting together, I was still healing from trauma. And I was thinking, you know, not because I thought I was this horrible person, but just because I'm at this beautiful ceremony with these very ancient people. They have ancient crystal skulls, which is something that I was just like, ah, that I get to even be in the presence of, you know? And when I was there, the medicine man, he comes up to me, he puts his hand on my back and gives me a hug. And he's like, you gotta let the flowers water in your heart. So after this, and this was December 21st, 2012, Back then, everybody was saying that the Mayans said that the world was going to end, but that was never the case. This was just a Western fabrication. See, what happened was the calendar ended because the people couldn't rewrite the calendar because they were going through all sorts of fightings with colonizers and settlers. So they couldn't continue the sacred ways and, you know, dot down the constellations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So on this night, I had a dream of this blue-skinned being with a trident, Tristula, Conch, Agada, and he was just flowing through the air with lightning striking like this, you know, really fast, really strong, really powerful energy. And I felt so good, so alive, just charged after this energy. I remember the next day there were tornado warnings, thunderstorm warnings, you know, and where I rode my horses, there was an indoor arena. So no one's riding because they think it's crazy to even consider it, you know, most horses spook. So I get on my horse and I start riding in this weather. I start doing everything in this weather, jogging, loping, even taking the reins off and just moving the horse with my legs. And I was so fearless. And for a while, I wasn't that way with the horses. So up until this moment, I was actually kind of more back to being scared. But at this moment, I was so fearless. And I didn't understand what I was seeing at that time. I think in my heart, in my mind, I thought maybe this is the medicine working to my ancestors to connect me. Because, you know, a blue skin being. And the certain mark he had, the certain pillock he had was, you know, three lines. So later on, when I started studying the scriptures, I realized he was in the riot. And it made sense because the power was such. And I started coming around different mystics of different traditions, medicine men, even psychics. And they would tell me that they get all sorts of sensations from me. And I thought, you know, this is cool, but I think I just rather learn to meditate and empty my mind because something about this is more special. Not like this is better or this is, but this was really the, the point of having any of these insights. I guess was just to empty the mind. And, you know, when you empty your mind and you go into these deep states, it's like you become an instrument for that divine energy. If you go to any consecrated spots, and you're very lucky to be in India because there's so many different consecrated spots, either Augusta Muni or any of the great rishis and songs, you could feel their energy. It's still there and it's still building. Not in the direction maybe they're doing it, but like just because it's existing, it's living energy. So then another thing that happened would be, this was the first time I heard of Maha Shivratri. This was 2014. And I was mystified by the energy of Lord Shiva. I was just like, wow, he's so impressive. It's so <laughs> cool. I didn't really know much about him back then, but I just realized I loved everything about him. I loved how he didn't care about people's egos. I loved how he was non-judgmental. I had devotees from every walk of life. But what I really loved about him was just his demeanor, like, I had this feeling that you could go in any state around him and he would be totally calm and cool. Like, okay, I don't really, you know, <laughs> you can hear someone say something bad shit crazy. And you'd be like, well, that's your problem. Really. I don't really have to do anything to do for you. <laughs> you know? And we hear these things in the scriptures all the time. about how we talk to his wife when she was angry at Ravana wanting to kill him. And he was telling her, you know, this won't make you feel any better, but I can't stop you. <laughs> so I see him in my dream on my Shirati night, and he's in this golden body, and he's dancing like this, very fast, very round, very loose, you know. He's just moving very free, just like this, you know. And he's taking me with him, and we're going through this really golden plane, like I'm talking very golden, milky kind of plane of existence. And I'm seeing it, and I'm just so mesmerized by it and its power. I remember a few months later, my friend, he was asking me for some advice because he was about to be a father and he was having some dreams that he felt were very psychological. So I was, so I started seeing Shiva in my mind's eye 
And he told me exactly what to say to him. And it was so on point with what my friend was feeling and thinking. And he was like, where did you get all this from? And I was like, hey, you wouldn't believe me if I told you, you know, because back then I wasn't very open to telling people, hey, I was seeing this dude in my third eye and he gave me this information about you. And, and another thing that really happened was when my childhood dog died, she was, I was 20 years old when this happened. So I had her from seven to 20 years old and I loved her very much, you know. I was holding her hand and we were going into this kind of golden plane of existence. And she told me, you know, I want you to let me go now. I need to go. I love you very much. You need to go do your thing. You need to remember consciousness and the divine. And she put me in a trance, like a very deep, like I couldn't get out until she left her body trance. So she sent me straight to my room. And I remember I could not leave my bed until she left her body. And it was very weird. So from then on, I just started learning meditation. I started studying Reiki. And Qigong, mostly Qigong. I liked yoga, but I was so flexible that the mobility-wise, I couldn't do it because I would overstretch into position. <laughs> Not even like the normal problems you have in yoga, like the super weird stuff. Like I would move the, too much this way or that way. And I'm very flexible, as you can see. You know. <laughs> so yeah. I started studying Qigong and energy. And I started looking at the metaphysics, alchemy. I got, I went down the rabbit hole. I will admit that to you fully. I went down the rabbit hole where I got obsessed with ETs, et cetera. But then what grounded me was I was like, okay, how to look at this from a useful point of view, not just a wee wee point of view, but like how to make this useful. So I started thinking about horses and, and working out. And I was like, what if you could use the state of consciousness when you work out, when you ride a horse? When you're doing something, you really need to be at your game, you know? If we think about the meditative state, how is it any different from a champion boxer, a champion dancer, anyone who's decently good, even a good tech person, you know what I mean? If you think about Steve Jobs and all these guys who are coming up with new technology, they were very influenced by esoteric schools. Nikola Tesla, Albert Einstein. There was another man who helped develop the nuclear bomb. He used to read the Bhagavad Gita. And they all learned Sanskrit and they were very into the esoteric science. So it very much fueled their science. So as you can see, it's still an ongoing process for me. Like I'm constantly taking bits from what I'm learning away, putting it back in. I'm not trying to get myself in trouble, but I'm taking lessons from the Self-Realization Fellowship, right? I work out. So some of like the tension exercises, I can't really do because my body just doesn't, is telling me not to do it, you know? But I really love his philosophical understanding of meditation i really love how he talks about not being mechanical with your devotion like think about it when you are learning learn something and you're so passionate that's the best state ever if yeah. you could replicate that you'd be on something and it's like that state's unbeatable so when yeah, someone's yeah. passionate about creator their meditation it's not something you can just mechanically replicate really it's something you either feel or you don't. And I started applying this more in my meditation. And that's how I'm doing right now. And that's where my journey is taking me. And You know, a uh, few minutes back uh, when you're explaining your entire story, there's a part of you that uh, had dreams, right? Like you were talking about you having certain like spiritual or like divine dreams. And for all the people who are listening, that might sound like crazy or like woo-woo or like whatever the whatever it is but the the thing is anything that happens right like any spiritual experience that anyone goes through like i've read a lot of books i've talked to a lot of people who have had some you know people do a lot of rituals and pujas with devotion and this certain things happen to them like you know miracle sort of things and, in, and india is full of it india is full of such temples and there are so many temples where there is a lot of living miracles and all the people around the temple, the place where they live, also believe that. And the thing is, the other part that is a great segue to this is the flow that you were talking about, right? I think there is a certain rhythm in which the universe is vibrating, right? Like the sequence of things, how it's going. And sometimes when you you are in that flow and you're just going with the universe, you know, like things just feel right. Like whatever is happening, you're just going with it. And all your dreams, I feel it's a manifestation of that feeling, you know. So 
I feel like this entire thing, like anything that we experience is a manifestation of something or the other. So, I believe that when you had uh, like Shiva in your dreams or like when you had certain things, right? It has been, it is a manifestation of a something that has already been a part of you, you know. Some people go to temple, yeah. they feel something and then they have dreams. And some people who probably had this energy inherit with them and they and that manifests as dreams you know like i don't want to sound crazy but i do personally believe that and i've seen people around me also experience stuff like that people do inherit their gifts and abilities from past generations my ancestor on my mother's side was baba buddhaji so on the Sikh religion, he was raised by Guru Nanak Deji, he lived until Guru Hargobanji's time period. My ancestor taught Guru Hargobanji, Guru Tegh Bahadurji combat. Even in his hundreds, he was going with them everywhere. And from that, my whole family stayed with the house of Nanak. So when after Guru, after Baba Buddhaji passed away, Guru Hargobanji, he personally came, he walked 10 miles to my ancestor's house so he could spend his last moments with them because my ancestor, he missed him. He grew up around the whole house of Nanak. He loved them so much that he couldn't bear not to see them during his final moments. And they loved him so much, vice versa, that they wanted to be there. So Guru Hargobhaji is like over seven feet tall, as you can imagine. He's carrying Baba Buddhaji's body to the pyre. And after this, my family, they still stay with them. So when... Guru Haraiji came, we did his coronation, Guru Krishnaji, Guru Tegh Bahaji, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, and his sons. We did their coronations as well. And our family very much stayed with them the whole time, fighting alongside them in warfare and combat. And I honestly do think it was in a way an addition to that ancient history of Kshatriya warriors, you know. Because before the House of Nanak, if you think about a lot of people from Punjab, that area, a lot of them get their blood from Bhati Rajputs, Kshatriya warriors, people from Jaisalmer, Jodhpur, those areas. They were great warriors and they were great spiritualists as well. And I really think that we do inherit some of that ancestral magic and power, you know. I met descendants of Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse, Geronimo, Wuvoka, who was like the ghost dance messiah here in Nevada County area in that area. And I met a lot of different descendants from a lot of different power families. And you can still feel some of that shred of energy. I think it's up to the soul to decide if it wants to experience that power or not. You know, you'll have some cousins on that side of family who aren't spiritual. And, you know, they want to play video games and they, they're obsessed with politics, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because, you know, in Punjab, if you're into politics, you're kind of, you know, making money and friends and partying it up. <laughs> you know? I'm not trying to mock anyone. It's just how it is. <laughs> and, you know, these you are very much right. It's true. Like a lot of these archetypes, like Mahadev and Narayan, they're archetypes for the creator field. I often believe the reason why creator field became Mahadev and Lord Krishna Bhagavan and so we people who weren't ready to focus on the formless, we had an image in our head that we could focus on and receive that same blessing, that same energy, that same power and hold it in. And, you know, when I would teach guided meditation to a lot of people here in California, I'd be like, you know, I'm not going to tell you to believe what I believe in because you weren't raised with that. We need to go at what your heart believes in, what you were raised with, what you believe in. And let that be the Godhead you, you feel, you seek. That's what Paramahansa Yogananda did too when he came to America. He realized, because Swami Yukteswar said, you know, when you go to America, you need to forget that you were raised by Hindus in a way. So when you teach the Westerners, you could open them up to Godhead without the veil of prejudice. He wasn't saying, let's forget the prayers and the power and where it came from. Because obviously when you go to any self-realization center, you will always hear a hymn to Brahma and Lord Krishna Ji and Makali and all these beings. But you'll also hear something about Jesus, too, because he included that in as his way of opening these students up to Godhead, you know, because he realized that these students, for them to focus on the divine and anchor it in, that image was very useful, you know. And when I talk to indigenous brothers from like the Maidu community or Lakota community, I'll be like, you know, I want you to see this archetype. Like my friend in the Maya tradition, there's a man called Thunderman. 
So Thunder Man, if you can imagine, he's like this huge Vajra hitting the ground constantly, super strong, you know? Kind of, you know? <laughs> and then in Lakota, they also have like a white buffalo woman who's like a very, you know, sweet, kind, older woman, an elder. She's the white buffalo calf woman. So if we could compare to one of our deities, maybe Parvati or Lakshmi, yeah. So these archetypes, they do exist in all different cultures, all different civilizations and peoples. And where we see it meet up, it's kind of funny, like the Sumerian tradition. We see some of this in South, Amer South America too, because they're deities that look just like Anu, Inki, Enlil, Nergal, Marduk, you know? And they were a lot of the earlier influencers of Aryavatra. And a lot of our Aryavatra traditions, they come from a lot of these people, the Sumerians, you know, and it's a very unique history because if we think about how others influence each other, it's very true. If you go to Egypt, for example, those people had a lot of Sumerian blood in them too. They were, of course, African Kemetic people, but they were also Sumerian as well. So they combine these traditions and you see that with the god Ra. The god Ra looks just like the Sumerian god Marduk. So I'm not trying to take away the power or legitimacy of any belief system. You know, I love our system, obviously, very much so. <laughs> but I am saying I agree with you, brother. These archetypes do come in our dreams from our ancestral memories. And that ancient crystal skull did bring up like the ancestors in a way, and that ancestral power and magic, because that's in the earth, you know. If we think about it, everything in the earth remembers everything that came before and came after. You know, it remembers the vibrations we touch. That's why in Qigong, they say to ground, you just have to keep the earth in your mind's eye. And you're grounding, you know. So that's a very that's a very true, and I really love the way you put it. Yeah, it's the also the the other thing that I really really believe the same as you is that let's take Shiva or you take Krishna or Vishnu or Narayan, like whatever that entire thing is or whatever you call God, you need something to focus on, and that's why you have this very physical. Uh, touch to that aspect, right? Like something that is so vague and vast, you're just giving it, it's a metaphorical representation of whatever it is, right? God. And also, if you look at it, right? Like when you look at Krishna, when you look at Vishnu, there is this very tiny, 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 tiny details to that, to that entire bigger picture where that, that each symbol or like each instrument is a symbolic representation of that manifestation, you know, like of that bigger thing. Do I make Very sense to you? So. I, agree. I agree with you. you know, one of the ways the divine would come into me energetically was lightning. I will always have a relationship with lightning. Sometimes it frightens me. Like that one time I told you when there was this huge lightning storm in California in 2020 during the summer, and it was very unexpected in Roswell area. And I see this bowl of lightning in my room and the blanket, it's like electric, you know, there's electricity on my blanket. And I'm spooked as hell because I'm thinking this thing's going to make me go boom, you know. <laughs> but, you know, I was in a crossroad in my life with my ex where, you know, we were on and off again. She's my kid's mom. So we were on and off again. And I really felt like this was their way of saying this has to be off. You need to move on, focus on the divine and focus on yourself and let go. And it was a very, like, you know, you ever watch Lion King where Rafiki hits him on the head with the stick? Like, hey, go this way now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's very true about the image. My son, he was doing this today earlier. He was so happy listening to Hanuman Manta by the Mystic Pandits. And he was staring at this image of Ram and Sita and Hanuman. And he was so happy from it that he wanted me to do it, too. Now, my <laughs> eyes were not good at looking at the computer screen, so I couldn't do it. And he got upset with me. Like, he's like, I'm enjoying this. I want you to do it, too. He's only two, but he loves meditating on these images. And, you know, maybe someone might not call it meditation, but the way he stares at these things for over an hour sometimes and listens to this music. He gets so lost into it, it's like all time stops around him. And I was just thinking, you know, there is something ancient in us that does this. Yeah. And we do inherit it from our ancestors and our genes. And so it is very true. It's so crazy, I do right? think that... So absolutely. We, were, we were talking about flow earlier, right? Like, the, if we can take time, universe, or like anything, it has a rhythm in which how things are flowing, right? And 
whether we do something or not we are also in the flow and we're just going with it and when we're doing things in accordance with the flow it feels like meditative and natural right like even when i'm doing this podcast right in few podcasts the while i'm talking right i enter this flow state where i'm just talking and whatever i think it translate better like i'm able to convey whatever i'm thinking very very clearly and that happens like there's a when, muse sitting on your shoulder yes it's just it just goes so naturally you know it it feels like you know this is how it's meant to be and uh, let's say if i made a new friend who's really been helpful to me or like who's been helping me grow the way how i became friends with that person is also so natural and it feels like universe has curated this tiny bit of things like you know what i mean it's like a puzzle that the universe is creating and we're just going with the flow and this is the same with good or bad things you know it all comes down to internally how are you trying to piece things together how are you trying to manifest things right so even for bad things i've seen so many people around me the more shit they talk <laughs> the more shit things happen to them and like the, oh, exactly and the, the the more they blame the people around them basically let's call it the negative energy you know like the more negative thoughts or energy that they have the more negative things come to them you know i don't want to sound woo woo but and i they get addicted seen, to it sometimes yeah, as well yeah, yeah it's their comfort zone it's their homeostasis it's very sad because if you think about anxiety you have to admit that there's a partial addiction to the adrenaline to get in their heart from it i used to have panic attacks when i was younger when i started meditating i've stopped having them for years i don't even remember what it was like to have one it's been such a long long time because i trained my body not to want that but you know it's very interesting i was posting something about acid reflux and healing it right so i explained how what helped me and there was this one person who came to me and you know he was having the horrible time with it, like waking up with acid in his throat at horrible times at night not being able to eat anything taking antacids which in some ways are not made it worse and then i was like you know what happens is i get that you're feeling horrible but you can't just pay somebody to do hand holding for you because then you're not going to go anywhere in life and that person might as well be your therapist because you're going to be pumping him with negativity and it wasn't my way of trying to shame him at all i was just trying to help him see like if you really want to change you need to take a chance to try a program that will help you if it doesn't help you after that time fine you learn but if you're going to insist on this hand holding you're going to be stuck in this pattern and it's very similar to a lot of things like people who have ptsd that is not combat related I'm not trying to denounce or ruin anyone's experiences or make fun of anyone because we all go through things in life. But there is a thing in someone with PTSD where they have to find that place in themselves where they miss being happy. They value life this much that they're willing to allow their mind and their thoughts to change. That they're willing to face those triggers that seem like these big demons from hell. But in reality, once you start facing them, they become weaker and weaker and they go away. That's what happens to a lot of these triggers in the mind. Now I'm not trying to give anyone medical advice, so I hope I don't get in trouble. <laughs> But a lot of these things that happen in the mind, they're addiction because we've gotten used to it. Like people are gonna be like, "Well, how is this addiction? This feels like crap." But here's the thing: your body got conditioned to feeling it, your heart rate got conditioned to feeling it, your brain got conditioned to feeling it. So when you're getting rid of it, you got to condition yourself again. to not enjoy it not to want to feel it you know you got to realize how your brain chemistry is working at this point so for me when I thought I had PTSD I was starting to take GABA and alpha cuz I wanted to reteach my brain how to go into flow state cuz that stuff puts you into an alpha state naturally I started meditating I would combine it with my workouts so I'd start feeling good I'd get a pump you know I'd look at a pretty girl she'd check me out I'd feel even better <laughs> you know I'd be like Arnold in the gym without saying anything inappropriate <laughs> I'd feel great you know and I'd be like there this is how I felt before I ever had this crap happen to me and I would feel so good right and I would start dancing and getting happy and then I'd get quiet and meditate And it's very much like Shiva, you know. Shiva has done this a few times in his saga where you know he'll go through some realization where he goes a little bit crazy and then he'll start to ponder why why did this happen why 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 and then he'll get over it and he'll start dancing he'll be so happy and then he'll meditate and go into this beautiful samadhi state that everyone would be jealous of you know because it's such a rare state to experience 
So when these things kind of happen to us, we do have the opportunity to work through and change our brain. And when someone is going through negativity, just like you were saying, brother, how they can pile it on and make it worse and worse. It's the next level of consciousness to teach yourself, hey, instead of making this worse, I'm going to be more stoked toward it. I'm going to be like, you know, I'm going to learn something from this. I'm going to try to build my positive vibration. And slowly but surely, that will prevail over the negative self-talk. That will prevail yeah. over whatever scenarios I'm putting in my head. Because yeah. once you get into that ball game, you really grow. Like Just like David Coggins says, you know, when you get in that state, when you're going through something and you're going back and forth in your head, like, how can I make this better? How can I do this better? How can I get this? And even if you're not coming up with that solution right away, your brain is expanding in such a way that you're going to be stronger and smarter than ever before. And I think energetically, when people are conscious to an extent, their life kind of does it to them where let's say something will get out of focus for them, right? And they're going to have to dig in to find that strength to hang on to their bliss, their devotion, and really use it as a way to combat whatever is happening to them. And once they do, it's like their bliss, their devotion becomes stronger. Their meditation becomes stronger. The, the bliss they go through when they're in somebody becomes stronger. Everything in life, when it's negative, we view it as, how is this challenge going to try to teach me how to move up to that next level? Because while we're alive, on a conscious level, you know what I'm trying to say, we always want to keep expanding and getting better because once we stop, that's when we know we're kind of in trouble. Right. And either a physical health sense or a mental conscious sense. Because unless we're like some sort of natural avatar born here on Earth, we shouldn't have everything worked out right away. You know, We just shouldn't be that great. And we don't want to be so good that we're ready to just go instantly, you know? So we want to constantly evolving and changing. And the thing about these challenges is like, how can we make these challenges our teachers? That's the next level. And everyone forgets that when something hard happens. And hey, I do forget it too. I'm not perfect. I don't think anyone's really perfect in brutal honesty. But like, how can we use these experiences to help maybe somebody else, you know, also like going through this and be like, you know, you might be able to take this and use it to launch yourself up faster than I did. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. It comes from a very h- hindsight perspective, right? Like you won't understand that while you're going through it. But you know what's the interesting thing about life? Whatever your belief system and whatever your values values are, right? Your life becomes a reflection of that. And it's so crazy that, like I've seen, uh, life is a very customized thing to that particular person, right? Like let's say you a speck of energy. Whatever your belief system is, whatever your value system is, life becomes a manifestation of that. And uh, I have talked to, I've I I've had Apurva Jupiti. She's a dance and movement therapist. So while she was on the podcast, in one of the, she was on the podcast twice. While we were talking to it, right? She believes that you know body physically stores trauma. Like our body stores exactly. trauma. That's why when some people go to massages or when they take, right? Like they start tearing up. And I've had the same conversation with a physical therapist of my grandmom's. Uh, like my grandmom's physical therapist. She also does this Reiki thing, you know, that you were talking about. She's a huge believer in this energy and all of that. And she can literally tell a nature of that person just by looking at where they have a pain, you know, and that just blew my off. So she came to help my grandmom overcome certain pains and looking at where she was facing the pains, she could tell what sort of a person my grandmom is because she also believes that our physical, like however we manifest pain or like whatever it is, it becomes a reflection of our ideology. And that just like, it's so crazy. I don't talk about this on usually on the podcast because I believe this so much that it sometimes becomes hard to express logically like why it makes sense. You just feel it sometimes, you know, like you feel it like this is the truth and it becomes hard to express. And that's what happened. You know, you know? one you know one of the wonderful things is what you just said is we are getting to a point where physical therapists, body workers, slowly the medical field is starting to realize there is a real strong connection between a person's psyche and their body and their healing. 
But acid reflux, it was very interesting because a lot of people with acid reflux, they did have anger issues. They did have anxiety issues, PTSD, et cetera. And once those issues start to clear from the acid reflux, a lot of these other issues will go away too, like almost like magic, like depression, anger, anxiety, and such a interesting connection. But just like what you were saying in body work with whoever these people are working with, your grandma or anyone else, they're working these things out of their body and it's releasing because their brain wanted to lock it in. Not consciously. No one does this on purpose. I'm just not trying to get in trouble. Though. <laughs> no one does this on purpose, right? So the brain is locking it in because it's like, you know, I want some catharsis to this. I want a conclusion to this. I want to understand this. Because our emotional side is a very special side. You know what I mean? A lot of people are like, oh, well, I'm embarrassed about my emotions or I'm embarrassed about this. And it's like, you know, depending on how you harness your emotions, it can be a very great thing. So when I work with horses, it's a very unique thing because they can tell your heartbeat from a mile away. Oh, they can tell when you're really pissed off, happy, stressed out. Yeah, exactly. And then when you sit on them, they can feel the tension in your body if you're pissed off or not either. And if you're too much like that, they might consider you a threat and want to throw you off. So horses are very sensitive to people. So a lot of horses, they love me. They would come up to me, give me kisses. Even horses that have been abused, they'd come up to me to give me kisses and hug me. And my mom and my trainers would always wonder why they love me so much. And I just realized my energy doesn't have this threatening demeanor. So it's very true, just like what your grandma was telling you and the Reiki teacher was telling you. It's very true. Animals communicate this way. So people also, to some level, communicate this way. But yeah. for animals, it's a bit different because that's the only way they communicate. They don't have a language. So they only communicate with their body. They only communicate with their smell. They only communicate with hearing someone's heartbeat. They only communicate this way. They don't have like a hundred different languages like humans do. In some yeah. ways, animals are smarter than us because they can live this natural design for eternity. In the flow. Someone's not hunting them back. Exactly. And once we understand this approach, we do everything a lot better. You know? Let's say I'm doing a desk job and I have to come up with an idea, right? If I find a way to make this idea fun and coming up with it fun, it'll come to me a lot better. Instead of thinking about the future, if I'm just feeling myself in my hand, I'm feeling myself in my feet, I'm listening to my heart breathe and following my breath in and out. I start to go into this moment to moment sensation, right? What will come to me will be much easier and natural because we're trying to spark that feminine of the brain. The Shakti of the brain, as well, you know, the Kundalini. We're trying to spark it for those moments of creativity. So there is an emotional connection for these certain ideas. We meet a lot of people in society who are so hard and want to act like they're tough and like bully people kind of deal with their body language or voice, and they're wounded. That's the yeah. reason they're that way. No one wants to be that way in a happy state. Like, I've gone through stuff in life and I could honestly never want to bully someone. I could never want to impose my will on someone. I'm the kind of person I don't even want to argue and change someone's mind, you know, because it's not who I am. I want to just honor the space in which they exist and hope they do the same. So a lot of people, you know, we're starting to realize that the way people conduct themselves and the way they approach you and talk to you, they're telling you their whole life story. They're telling you, oh, you know, I went through this, so I'm going to do this now. And horses are kind of similar because if a horse went through, let's say a horse had a person who used to beat the crap out of them. That horse will be very shy to touch. That horse will be very spooky. So when I start working with a horse like this, I will do approach release. Approach release is where, let's say, the horse is here and I'm there. I'll go a little bit like this. I'll look at his body language. Then I'll back off. I'll go again a little bit like this. Look at his body language. If he seems like he's ready for me to come closer, I'll come a little bit closer and then I'll back off. And I'll keep doing this until he eventually lets me into his orbit. And then I'll pat him gently and I'll stop from there. I won't push it any harder because this horse is telling me whoever worked with me before didn't care about my boundaries, didn't care about my body language, didn't care about learning who I was. They just wanted to control me and dominate me and they broke me. So horses gave me this understanding of flow with people mm -hmm. as well. They give me this understanding because whenever we're learning something, we want to love it. We want to feel 
good. We want to feel excited. We want to feel like a little kid dancing and having a time. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whenever we do anything we do and we love, we want to feel like this. We want to feel like a pet who's the happiest pet in the world and jumping around, <laughs> everyone crazy. We want to be that kind of person whenever we do something. And if you talk to anyone, like anyone who's good at whatever they do, they are that way. Yeah. Maybe they're a bit more reined in because of people. Like I'm sure if we talked to Sadhguru, we'd find out that the dude is very happy and excited about whatever he's doing in life. You know what I mean? He maybe conducts himself as, you know, a serious bubba when he's on the TV, but I'm pretty sure underneath that he's this really funny, goofy, happy guy, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's so cool. And he man. loves what he does like a kid, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. And also the energy part, right? Like you said that animals, like they know the threat or uh, they can sense that. Have you ever been in an environment where you feel like uh, this is not safe or when you talk to someone you just feel like you know this person isn't right like you get this negative feeling exactly. when you're around that person and especially women right like because evolutionary wise they are they are wired physically biologically to sense threat right like because they have to take care of the offsprings in the That's forest very true. so like, like are there any predators around and all of that on a very energy level also uh i've seen a lot of women has this naturally like where they can tell if this person is safe or not where they can tell this environment well, the way is the safe communicate or not well the communicate with us gives you a hint yeah, yeah. you know they'll they'll, yeah. they'll ask you these questions in a very investigative kind of way to get how you think about this subject and that subject yeah. and yeah. when they want to break it to you that they might not be interested because they heard you talk about this subject yeah. they'll do it in a very sec and i'm not trying to be disrespectful i'm just saying that this is a defense mechanism and you're right you know i used to kind of be have my feelings hurt by this because i'm a very direct like you know I'm not going to lie to you. I'm always going to tell you what I feel, what I want to say, what I think. And maybe that can be a weakness to some people, but to me that's who I am and I'm not changing. So, well, for me, when I started realizing this about women, I was like, you know, I can respect this about them. They're like a horse this way. They're going through something. <laughs> they want to make sure they're safe. They want to make sure that person isn't some psycho weirdo. You know, they they're doing their thing to make sure they're in a good safe landing zone, you know? And they want to make sure they feel good around you. And I don't blame them at all. There are a lot of weirdos out there. You know, <laughs> I remember one time I was with my kid's mom. We were going to some sort of event. I can't remember. We were at a gas station. Some mentally ill person comes up to her asking for money. I could tell he's a junkie right away, you know. So I go up to him with my chest up like this. I'm like, hey, are you good, man? And he sees me confident and a little muscular. And he starts backing away slowly and running off. Because she was a woman, he was coming up to her, approaching her for money, all this stuff, right? But then he sees me, this muscular dude, who, you know, is confident, and he runs away. And that is why a lot of women have this defense mechanism, and you can't blame them, you know? That's course, how a lot of, of people course, are. Yes. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have an open heart. I'm just saying that there, there's a reason why we open our heart in meditation more than we do when we're walking around random people <laughs> and, you know, random situations. And it's not to be a disrespectful jerk you know i've exercised with animals where i open my heart to them as a way to invite them into my field same thing with children like i my sons they're very good with me and they always feel so calm around me like they want to dance and they're happy and they never want to leave me and so when i meet like a new kid who might be a little bit shy what i do is i open my heart and i kind of do this approach and release thing you know where it's like i'll approach if they're shy nervous i'll back away and i'll smile not in a like a you know, I'm trying to get you to do this kind of way. I'm like more like, in a, well, I wonder how you feel. You know, I wonder what you're thinking now. You're an individual. I like to establish that right away with anyone I talk to. You're an individual. You have a sovereignty. You have a power within you. And it's not my job to make you do this or that. It's my job to listen to you and be like, well, what are you trying to convey to me? Because I can learn something from this. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, the the energy thing right like i have this really close uh someone who's like really really close to me so she can you can she can sense you know like when she's talking to someone she just feels this like it's an empath in a way yeah it's like yeah like a very huge impact and she can tell if this person is safe or not and 99.99% of the time she's right she's 100% right because it it, it feels you know like inside and also the going back to you and your relationship with your kids or you your relationship with your animals or you 
your relationship with other kids or other people while you were saying that something hit me you know when you're happy happy things happen when you're sad sad things happen have you ever been in a situation where you you're sad it things? gets worse yes because i think that this is not <laughs> some vague philosophy that i'm saying whatever you're feeling right your feelings manifest into that action so let's say if you're happy if you're feeling good that feeling manifests actions that would be exponentially good to you again like it will be an add on if you're that's sad very true, you know, that's you know. why we when we are sad we listen to sad songs to become even more sadder you know like it's just this you know it does backfire on us yeah <laughs> yeah it's so i think that internally right like i think internally you should be bliss- blissful and happy like i i know that we cannot be happy all the time but even if you're not happy or sad we like we we try to be in this like sort of blissful calm like neutral state i think that's better so like lord krishna was in the mahabharat despite whatever he was going through he was always trying to be happy and positive and rocking it out you know even when him and radha couldn't be together he gave her the flute and he did it in a very romantic way you know and instead of making it sad between them it, he was like in this calm kind of kiddish way and that is very true instead of making it like this depressed angry thing you make it this joyful thing it does start to become good and i'll give you an example when i was first learning about bodybuilding and i was getting good enough so that i could lift again and i could learn proper form and everything i started watching pumping iron i met arno schwarzenegger when i was a kid twice because my dad he was a councilman and arno schwarzenegger was governor of california so i did not know anything about bodybuilding back then if i did i probably would have asked a dude question <laughs> I'm a fat boy that way though. <laughs> so I'm all excited about going to the gym and the gym I go to, I had no idea it was full of IFB pros from the International Federation of Bodybuilding. Some of these guys were Mr. Olympic competitors. One of them, uh, Kim, he actually competed against Ronnie Coleman back in the day. Oh. Another one, Matt Ogus, who taught me my deadlift form, my squat form. He is one of the biggest all-natural bodybuilders in, on the earth right now. as well as Chris Alkins. So I was already around all these famous people in the all natural bodybuilding world and the bodybuilding world. And it was just because I loved it so much. I was so excited about it. I was so happy about it. And I still get that way when I talk about lifting, you know? And I have a lot of people come up to me like, you know, aren't you kind of addicted to it? And I'm like, you know, I really am addicted to it. I don't feel bad about that. I like that I'm addicted to something that's so positive, that makes you look better every day, that not only makes you look better, but makes you feel better every day. and then not only that it makes you nicer to other people every day because you're getting stronger and you have to be that way you know yeah. and then at the same yeah, time yeah. it like raises the level of people who can come into your life up not down up yes like yes. you look better and better so everyone who's talking to you is starting to look better and better can you just pause you for a second too. can you just pause you for a second when you said right like when you're hitting the gym when you're becoming stronger when you're looking good you become like calmer you, you become good to other people right i just want to pause there for a second because people if if you are insecure about something you seek it externally right so people who bully people who are mean they are lacking something internally that's why they are seeking us elsewhere i had this friend who was a, who had a who had a very narcissistic traits so he wanted to be like a dominating one in the in, in the friend circle and that's an output right like that's an outcome that's an action but internally he wanted a validation for himself that you know what i am powerful like you know you know what like i am in a place where i can like everyone else will listen to what i say if he is not insecure about that he'll stop seeking that right so when you hit the gym yeah. when you're confident in your own self when you're confident in your own skin you won't seek that externally right so that's why it makes you calmer peaceful so i just wanted to like even, even before we uh, it grounds you cuz you get your blood pumping you know and when you're going into those compound lifts what's happening is you are grounding like when you deadlift and you're focusing on the form and you're breathing and you're expanding this area you are grounding into the earth you are becoming stronger and grounded if you think of the people who are grounded versus the people who are stuck in their head all day those guys that are grounded or used they usually look better most of the time don't they and like let's compare yogis real quick i hope i don't 
get attacked by anyone for saying this stuff. <laughs> La- Baba Neem Karoli, he was not in the best shape. People used to have to remind him to go to the bathroom, sit up, stand, walk around, you know. And then we compare him to someone like Sadhguru or Baba Ramdev, where they're always active and moving around. They're going on their motorcycles. They're doing everything all over India, right? You can tell that they're more grounded. They're not in their head all day. They're very grounded. And that's why energy can really reach people on a multi-level. A part of the thing that's wrong, I think, in the metaphysical psychic community is they're so in their head, they're not in their body. When you're not in your body, you cannot expand that energy on earth, truly. If you think of Mahadev and Krishna, the reason why we see these guys always muscular when they come to earth, it's because they're grounding that divine energy in. That divine energy gets built in the bicep, it gets built in the tricep, it gets built into the abdominal region, it gets built with every swing, and it gets stronger and stronger because it's anchoring. They're anchoring Godhead in, you know. So it's very <laughs> true. Yeah. It's uh it's finding God in everyday things, you know. Like that's a, that, that's what I personally believe. In one of the basic profound philosophy from Hinduism is. Krishna says this in Gita. He says that like he's the son. He's this. There's this entire monologue. He goes on every moment in our life. Everything is him. And when you start to see God in everybody, when you start to see God in everything, everything becomes divine. You know, like every single thing becomes divine. Even suffering becomes divine if you start seeing God. Have you ever that. tried this as a meditation? Me. As an open-eyed meditation, like when you're walking around, yes. you start looking for Krishna yes. and every single person, every single thing. It becomes the most profound state ever. Like you almost feel like you're you just took something when no one was looking because you feel so like lucid and relaxed and calm and blissful and happy. And he really has that energy that was so strong, so blissful. And even today, when we chat Hare Krishna. We feel this divine, happy, ecstatic energy, yeah, this playful yeah. dancing kid, the lover. We feel everything about this guy. And same thing with Mahadev, you know, when we chat his energy, we feel this calm, yeah. blissful guy who, who, you know, is beyond the world's problems. You know, and lives I in the world and at the same Finding God in everyday things makes you love and respect those things. So I think internally it makes you a happier person. That's what I believe. You know, for all the people who we are living in a generation where being negative and ni- nihilistic is trendy you know like if you look at any netflix movie it's very sad anything, yeah and that's the most saddest thing and when you talk about when you condemn god or when you say something shitty about uh, spiritual practices it makes you look smarter but the problem is when you when you utter certain chants right like when you say certain shlokas it's this vibration right like, like there is this internal vibration that brings that sound and your body vibrates in that Absolutely. rhythm and you start seeking that thing just saying chanting krishna if that b- helps us become more positive and if our body's vibration changes imagine what the source of it imagine the vibration that krishna has just by uttering his name if we become this positive Imagine this. I feel source. like a happy little kid when I think about it in my third eye, you know. <laughs> I feel like this happy dancing little kid that can't stop moving. At the yeah. same time, I feel yeah. like everything is flowing, you know. And that's just one feeling. But I absolutely yeah. agree with you. And it's very yeah. true. When you chant a mantra very slowly, like the Om, kind of, and let's say you breathe into your diaphragm like this, and you go, Om. Mm. You're using your index finger to touch your third eye. You're using your thumbs to close your ears. And you're really vibrating the third eye with your tongue at the roof with the Om. And you're making your brain really tune into the Om car and listen to it. So then you start this with every other mantra you can use, like uh, the Mantra Mutri, the, any Gatri mantra, even Krishna's Gatri, any mantra at all. And you start really tuning in, you become so relaxed. So I really do think that when we were talking about how, you know, it seems in to make fun of spirituality, it seems in to disrespect God. That's why people think that the world is run by these elitist guys who are trying to destroy everything and are evil. It's because it would make sense from this perspective. You know what I mean? Like, why are they teaching people to be so low vibe, unhappy? And why are they teaching people to be this way? So when we are like chanting mantras, 
and stuff. We're rebelling in the best way possible, you know. Uh, I remember on The Secret, I'm sure you might remember this too. Yeah, yeah, they were yeah. saying instead of being the anti-war rally, be the pro-peace rally, you know. And yeah. that's what happens when you practice meditation and stuff and you start chanting, you become the pro-peace. And I honestly, I don't always like activism because I sometimes think it puts people into a negative mind state or a divisive mind state where they want to be us versus them, which is never good and healthy, I think. But the only good thing is I feel like maybe it might shed on some light that it's wrong to say that stuff about people's belief system. Maybe it might be good. And this is the only time I'll ever say it because you'll never hear me post that on my page because I try not to. <laughs> <You know. laughs> so I don't really try to. But from this perspective, I'll have to say maybe it is a slightly good thing that you're trying to say. You know, it's not good to talk badly about people's beliefs. It's not good to attack their individuality. It's not good to attack their personal choices that they're making that don't hurt anyone. And I think that shred of it is actually a really wonderful, profound, and powerful thing. But I do think that the more the West gets sick of Western religion, will come toward Eastern spirituality and religion because if you think about spirituality it is truly an eastern concept the way we used to live in india where we didn't used to have a religion we just you know we'd go to the shiva temple we'd go to the vishnu temple and then when other people came in like the buddhists we'd go to the buddhist temple then we'd go sit in the mandir and even for a while when islam came they would go to the mandirs too like they weren't always just like oh we gotta do my fucking thing you know they weren't always like that so Indian culture was always like very inclusive. Everyone would go into this thing, that thing. That's where they got spirituality from in the West. You know, I mean, even same thing with Japan. We still see this in Japan. You know, people will go to the Shinto shrine, but they'll go to the Buddhist shrine. They'll go to the church. They'll go to this thing. They'll go to that thing. There's never a direct religion in Japan, honestly. People will never tell you that they believe in this religion in Japan or that religion in Japan. They'll just say, you know, we like all these practices. All these practices are bomb. All these practices are awesome. And that's why I also never condemn sexuality either because there are a lot of people who are like, oh, pleasure is bad. But it's like, you know, if it's consensual and people feel happy, I'm not going to say that because they could put them in a profound state. They could activate church kundalini. But it's a very much so like you have to know that this person fits you and vibes with you very well. Yeah, It has to yeah. be that kind of relationship where you vibe each other so well that when you are together that way, it doesn't cause you any damage. Because let's say you're not traumatized, but the person you're with is traumatized. You will absorb that trauma unknowingly into your energy field. So you have to be careful in that sense and regard. But I honestly firmly believe that the way humanity is right now, that people want to open themselves up to spirituality there are a lot of people who are doing the wrong thing by coercing people into spirituality with money and this and that. And I don't agree with this at all. But I do feel like in people's hearts, they want to believe in something divine. They did this test on one of Morgan Freeman's documentaries when they're talking about God and how it affects the mind. There were two meditators. One was an atheist. He's really good at meditation, though, you know. And there was the one who's not really great at meditation, but he loves God in his own way. So they went under an MRI, and there was a certain part of this man's brain that lit up when he was thinking about God that the atheist could not reach. So there is something special in our human brains that needs to believe in the divine. It needs this divinity. It needs this connection to function at this higher realm perception. And people can be like, oh, well, maybe that's just one test for this or that. But here's the thing. Our brain wants it. Our brain needs it. Just yes, like our brain I needs don't it. personally. Our brain absolutely. needs it, but we think we don't want it. Exactly. And, you know, a lot of people get mad at me for saying this. I've felt some really dark shit around people who don't want to believe in creator. <laughs> <laughs> or not believe in something like very dark, creepy, like, you know, I want to run away from you because you scared the crap out of me kind of energy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's not my way to put down atheism because I know not every atheist is a bad person. But I do understand why Krishna was saying in the Bhagavad Gita, there is something about this nature of mind that is demoniac. There's something about it that trends you toward the darker aspects of life when you're an atheist. It's not saying that they're evil or not. There's bad a possibility. It's saying there's, exactly, because you're denying the best, most joyful states of consciousness. There's nothing more wicked than that in a way, you know? Yeah, I think that the reason why most of the people don't want to believe in religion or God is the way how these certain uh, uh, torchbearers 
sold this entire concept you know even in india also we are you admire india so much and you are jealous that you know i have access to so many different temples and i'm closer here but in such a rich country in such a uh, the government yeah <laughs> yeah like so many government have come here here people are fighting that like my religion or is superior and my caste and sub caste is superior i've seen so many people around me like literally uh, my closest relatives it's worse than the last few years though there is this element of ego in spirituality you know like when the more you see god there is this part of you that believes that you know god and that makes you feel like you're better than people around you you know what i mean like it's a ever... very dangerous thing because it yes, will destroy yes. your vibration completely yes. and you won't know it until it's almost too late and you have to start over so one of the things i like to do is sometimes i'll go through town and i will not brush my hair. hair I'll not look clean I'll wear an old shirt you know I won't try my best to care about my appearance and my mom is like you know people are going to be mean to you because of this and I'm like well if they're mean to me because of this I don't want them in my life I don't want people who are just judgmental and you have to look this way to be this way mentality anywhere in my life those people suck <laughs> and she looks at me Period. like well that's not nice of it but I'm just honest like those people suck they're the reason we have so many mental health issues in our society if they were and I'm not trying to say they mean like I don't want to hurt them but if they weren't in our society I guarantee you it'd be so much more chill so much more relaxed so much more flow so much more and the thing about these god men is this is why you should never believe in someone who tells you that they're god or tells you that they're this or that why I'm careful when I talk about my experiences they come up because they're a part of that journey and I have to share them but I never try to share it in a way that tries to make me look special you know because I'm not special I consider myself like a molecule in this time and space I want my energy to also reflect that like I don't think I'm this or that I don't think I'm great or that my ancestor he loved the gurus and my favorite thing about him was his humility He never considered himself a saint. He never considered himself special. He never considered himself great. There's a story about Guru Arjan Devi's wife coming up to him. So she comes up to him with this coarse on carriage, servants, everything, you know, works. And he refuses to see her because he thinks that this is like a big show, you know. So she goes to Guru Arjan Devi and she's like, Baba Puruji would not see me, you know. She's like very like sad. Like, so he starts laughing at her because she's telling him how she approached him. She's like, he's a... old man saint like he lives this way and he's not going to appreciate you coming up to him like this <laughs> so she comes she walks to him not in like a fancy suit with food she made herself no servants and she tells him you will bear a son who will vanquish the mogul empire and start to ruin because back then you know the moguls were starting to be really harsh on us punjabis in the north they were like you got to do it this way you got to do it that way we're going to come here we're going to come there you know And Baba Budaji and the Singhs were like, you know, we don't want this life. We're going to let people live the way they want to. You can't do nothing to us. So Baba Budaji and all these people, he raised them to be humble about their power. Even though Guru Har Gobind Ji was a seven foot tall giant, his kara was like this big. You hear about Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji too. The reason he was called Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji was because he was good with the sword. They were not very show offy about their skill sets. and they encouraged us in our tradition i'm not saying that all sikhs live this way i'm not saying punjabis live this way because of you know the materialistic stuff you see on tv and the music videos would probably make you laugh at me right now <laughs> but i am saying that there's an encouragement to realize the more humble you are the less show offy you are the happier you will be like i like to share my philosophies but i always like to clarify you know i'm not important i'm not so i'm not this or that i'm just someone who's feeling great about this realization and I want to share it with you because if it helps you I'm very ecstatic for you if it doesn't I don't really mind I mean I hope you find something that does help you yeah uh, there's one guy he was telling me that the ass reflex stuff that I wrote on my page wasn't helpful to him you know and I was like you know I don't take it personally because I just want you to be happy like it's not about me it's about you being happy I don't care if you think that I'm smart or if you think I'm the court jester right now i just want you to be happy you know <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you know earlier you, you we were talking about people who are negative right and if 
like if there is less negativity world would have been a better place than it is right now and uh, i've been Absolutely. i've been thinking about this particular thing for uh quite some time i'm you know how i work is every now and then there is this one philosophy or something that just stays in my mind and anything that I look around i like things just points in a direction where that philosophy becomes more clear so i just had this feeling while i was listening to some songs like devotional songs or like i was in a very emotional state you know like i was just thinking about god i was listening to these songs the thing about songs it makes you that you know especially like god songs it makes you emotional your body vibrates in a particular rhythm i just had this feeling that everything is divine though even evil is also divine you know there is something it very, is in a way. there is something spiritual about the possibility you know just they the cannot ability. exist without each other Yes. It's the yes. natural design of this Maya illusion we call yes. the life before you escape the cycle of life and death. If it wasn't for evil, you'd want to stay here forever and you wouldn't care about reincarnating or not. I was just talking to one of my friends about that today because he was like, you know, I know do you really believe that moksha is your goal, infusing with creator, ending in the suspended animation state where you're just in your higher self cocooned in this spiritual crystallis is like your goal. But for some people, they want to keep coming back because they enjoy doing this and they enjoy doing that. And I'm like, you know, we're not putting this down. We're just saying that for us, this is not the ultimate goal. For us, fusing back to this crystallis, free of the Maya illusion is the ultimate goal. Because we really believe that as long as you are on this planet, this world, there will always be good, there will always be evil, and they will always come at each other. And it's not to be like negative, it's just, to understand that this is the nature of the world. For example, we're in Kali Yuga right now. So eventually we'll be there will be a Satyu, but then eventually Kali Yuga will have to return someday. Yeah. If we you think know, about how humanity is. So you said that this is Maya illusion, right? Like this is an illusion. We should not get indulged into this. Like there is a higher state. But it also teaches you so much stuff too, you know. It's like your teacher at the same time as the illusion. And that's what you were saying about how good and evil. If you think about it, yeah, I call it my illusion, but it's also your teacher. It's your inspiration to want to do things a certain way. Yeah. You know? I have both the mindset, you know. Like I agree and disagree with you at the same time. You I feel that it a, a lot of indian hinduism hinduism philosophy say that you know all like to be detached from the materialistic world and see that you know everything is an illusion maya like we are just all the sensorial things is just an illusion the ultimate test would be in the materialistic world and yeah. still want to fuse yeah. with your higher self that is a true test that is the true skill set i honestly do believe if you do it that way you definitely won't come back because you're dealing with the temptation you're dealing with all the tests and you're still able to make it true versus if you think about it, there were so many stories of sages who kept coming back even though they were great at meditating even though they had the perfect life spiritually mentally emotionally they still came back cuz they had to learn something about this or that so it's very true what you're saying you can't just escape the stuff and then fuse with your higher self at the end of the day because in a way you're kind of cheating if you're doing it that way but if you're going through a materialistic life you're dealing with the stresses of modern life and then you do it you're definitely not going to come back cuz you must have learned your lessons you must have made your peace with your inner flaws your inner turmoils i honestly think that a lot of these metaphors like i'll put it this way this is when my perspective is on this and what i love about free thinking is you need to have different ideas constantly talk to each other think about europe they called it the dark ages when everyone had the same thought process and you weren't allowed to think any differently Then you had Florence, Italy in 1600s. Everyone's thinking differently. People are just talking to each other completely different, right? Some people are atheists, some people believe in God, some people believe in crazy sex all the time. Some people believe in celibacy. Some people are believing in trying to revive the ancient religion secretly because, you know. And then at that same time in the world, we had the Bhakti movement in India 1500s, 1600s. You know, we had this Bhakti revolution where we had saints, different religions joining in to spread this consciousness and awareness. So I absolutely do agree that we need different opinions constantly to work with each other to grasp that divinity that we seek. Because mentally, let's say if we all think the same, what's going to happen is we're going to become stagnant. And the energy will not move anymore. Cuz we all think the same, right? But if we go thinking differently it has to constantly keep evolving changing getting stronger and stronger 
Yeah. So yeah. when we yeah. think about it, yeah. I mean, I respect the stage. You can live off in the mountains, meditate all the time, not have to deal with drama and stuff. But I also respect the guy who still has a family, still dealing with stress, and still meditating daily and, you know, has that goal. So it's a but very interesting is, experience. You know, there's there's the no one right is, or wrong, really. Earlier, we talked about for seeing God in everything, right? Sometimes I look at things and they're so beautiful. I cannot tell myself that, you know, this is my this is illusion. Like, I just, I, I, I'm just in awe of how beautiful this entire nature, like how things, when we look at this entire world, right? This entire ecosystem, how one thing is a food for other thing and how the, uh, the waste of this is a food to another thing. It's so magnificently beautiful that I... The mindfulness aspect. Yeah, and I, and I don't think that this entire thing is an illusion. You know, like a part of me says, you know, this is God. Like, this is God. Like, whatever you know, you're going through. Yeah. It's very interesting. Whenever English translates a language, it's never 100% correct. <laughs> it's always, like, really... Maybe 1% True. to 15% correct. And then the rest <laughs> of it, you're like, thinking, what? My friend, you know, he lives up north, right? So his tribe, one of the tribes that live next to him is called Yuki, which means an enemy in another tribe's language. Oh. So the government deliberately named him that so these guys would want to fight each other and go head to head so they could make taking their land, you know, divide and conquer easier. So a lot of these things that the English, I'm not bad melting anyone's nationality. I'm just saying a lot of the intention of English learning a new word, it's not the most honorable translation like it's yeah. not going to be 100 percent correct like if we think about ikongar in punjabi when english people translate they mean all oh, god is one but now when guru nanak Deji was talking about this he was saying that the molecules and all existence is within everything creation is within every molecule within everything it was a very different way of speaking. While when the English translated, it was very Abrahamic, monotheistic kind of thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are a lot of words that get mistranslated. And True. I agree with you. There's something about being mindful about the world we're in that's just as good as the form of Godhead as meditating on Shiva or meditating on Vishnu. Again, I hope I'm not going to get for saying these things <laughs> but there is something beautiful about the moment that is the best thing like i honestly love mindfulness meditation if i ever take a time off for meditating i always go back to mindfulness even between my sets when i work out i always do mindfulness like let's say I, i'm training legs and i'm breaking a pr so maybe my glutes or something sore i'll like feel that area for a second and then i'll feel the area that's relaxed and a lot of athletes do this nowadays, so that way they have that edge of recovery time when they train. And same thing, like when I'm training, to keep my form perfect, because you know when you deadlift or squat, it's such a technical form. You're not just going up and down. You're bracing your core, you're breathing, expanding to the sides, you're going down, you're coming up slowly, slowly, you know. First, you breathe out, then your heels go into the ground, you clench your glutes, and then your core even braces a little extra, you know. And then you're restarting again. And it's such a technical, technical lift. But you're, it's forcing you to be mindful at the same yeah, time of yeah. every sensation. And training. The people who I like don't like training, they don't understand how to be mindful of these sensations and this thing, you know? Because there's something about training that really will get everyone, no matter who they are, usually more in their body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or maybe their <laughs> body is holding some trauma, just like we were talking earlier, you know? But I absolutely agree. Like, there is nothing wrong with being mindful in the moment. There's nothing sinful about it. And that's why I don't ever condemn free sex or free love or anything like that either. It's because there's nothing wrong with being happy and being a good, fair person and being honest. There's nothing wrong with an authentic communication. There's nothing wrong with having open sincerity. Yeah, yeah. You know, the other thing about workout is... Uh, that is, I can by far say that is a sort of my meditation because with workout, there is so much internal conflict that happens that it's so... And contractions. It, it's so crazy because let's say there is this ego part of you that wants to lift heavy, right? And there you know that if you ego lift, it, you're going to be injured and you're, you're not going to make a significant progress. You need to be in a very mindful state where you are doing something. You know that flow state even in exercise where 
if your max is 15 you stop at 13 because you're you're not over exhausting yourself but you've sent enough signal for your body to recover and build muscle and do like the form and <coughs> getting better at it so that's the first part like where i'm not ego lifting and i'm not indulging myself too much in the ego and what other people see and think that's the first aspect that's beneficial and the second aspect that's beneficial is growth you know seeking growth like when i lift weights i am i will anyways reach failure no matter what i cannot lift for 3 hours straight right when i'm doing after 15 16 17 or 10 8 after a certain amount of rep i fail and eventually after one or two weeks from 8 i go to 9 to 10 i start lifting heavier i can see myself grow and that gives me confidence do you write your workouts in a notebook uh right now no you do so you should because the fun thing is once you start like writing how many sets how many pounds you're using each time you will get to compare yourself week by week on a basis to see how much you've improved you can write little notes and what happens is when we work out we sometimes forget what we're doing like we'll forget how much weight we're using and this will actually stain our progress my train mad august He's like the all natural godfather of all natural bodybuilding because he's one of the best conditioned all natural lifters ever. He's never been injured deadlifting or squatting. So anyway, one of the first things he told me is you need to write your workouts down. You need to make sure you know what you're lifting, you know what you're doing. And he made sure I'd avoid ego lifting because he told me the secret to getting a PR is recovery. The better you recover, the better you're going to get stronger and stronger and you'll be able to maintain your joints in the back, etc. And when you do that, everything gets better. It's very freaky. Like last week, I was doing a deload week, right? So deloads where you, I do literally half the amount of sets I usually normally do, on every body part. But I was breaking PRs too, because my body was resting and it was getting stronger and stronger every set. And when I deadlifted, I actually broke my PR, which shocked me, and I had zero pain, like at all, no tight. in the back no tight in my butt nothing and i felt so good and i was so happy and it was very interesting and i was thinking yo this is the results of actually looking at your training from a block by block basis and going with the process you know because when i was first in the gym i used to eagle lift like i wanted to be a power lifter cuz i used to watch west side barbell against the world or something and i wanted to be those guys You know, I wanted to be that big motherfucker that just walks around like this all day, you know. <laughs> Cuz I love strength and I love the power and I love the adrenaline rush. You know, I always had a high testosterone even when I was a teenager and a kid. Like when I was 12 years old, I had a full beard. I would shave, but it would come back like a full beard within a month. It was so freaky. And I was like wondering, "Well, what good is this?" And then when I started getting into weightlifting, I was like, "Oh, that's what it's good for, you know." <laughs> So on the periodization what I really like about this concept is let's say the deload week is your last week. And then the week after that you're adding more sets, a little bit more intensity. The week after that more sets, more intensity, and then the final week of intensity is where I do an isolated set, 5 days of working out, 30 sets each body part. That's mm-hmm. my most intense week before I go to my deload, you know. And then when I go to my deload, it's like my body's getting a rest at the same time while it's getting stronger. And I realized from my because I had experienced this myself before I understood its benefits. What my trainer was trying to tell me all those years ago was when you do it this way, you're learning how your body is going to progress. Your body starts to tell you, "Hey, even though I'm resting, I'm really closer to hitting this now." And And I'm even more closer to hitting this now, and it starts to tell you, let you know when you're getting there, and your joints they start to get stronger and stronger. So instead of getting more injured, like some people who are anti-working out will tell you, the opposite happens. You just got stronger, and you just didn't even notice, and your body will start moving better. And it's really crazy thing because I really do believe our body has its intelligence. They sometimes say in the legends that the rishis, when they were starting to give us Ayurveda. and the vedas and the sciences they would just go into their body breathe and their internal body gave them all the information so i really do feel like our internal bodies have this wisdom and intelligence and mm. i think if we look at a lot of different traditions they would say the same thing too i'm not 100% sure but like i know like the incans they say similar things about the body how the body's okay. this smart and knows this much and you know it's very interesting The Incans also believed in chakras. Some of them, like the Keros, their okay. priests do believe in chakras and the wheels and how they turn. And 
when it comes to like hidden civilizations, I'm not sure if you know this. Egypt used to talk about Atlantis, so did Greece. But so did the Caros in South America. They all spoke about Atlantis and a civilization being this one specific area. So I'm not saying for sure that it's real, but I'm saying that it's very interesting to think that all of our ancestors back in the day had very similar beliefs and maybe possibly knew each other to some yeah. extent and learned from each other. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Because we look at the world, we do find a lot of things in common, like art, st style of cutting stone, even stuff we can't reproduce today. I do believe it does start with the internal body and the mind. This process of emptying the mind yeah. becomes this point true, for grabbing true. it, you know? Do you know Wim Hof? Uh, exactly. I practice this method every day. I do the cold showers, ice baths. Yeah. So much. I walk around that... and just this, even during the winter. So it's like how our body adapts, it's so crazy. You know what? Like when I wanted to talk to you, right? I didn't expect us to talk about these many different topics. Like even when we had called the other day, we just had like a short introduction call, right? But uh, you are a very interesting man and I was very, I'm very happy that I had you here and we had all of this conversation. I'm very grateful too. It's a beautiful thing we let divine energy build itself into whatever form it's going to come, you know? I'm very happy. I'm very, I'm, a, I'm very blissful. And this is a good start after a long break that I took from doing podcast, it starts with you and I'm glad it is you. So, hey man, thank you so much for being here. And uh, it didn't I feel really like... enjoyed our conversation. <laughs> it didn't feel like I was recording a podcast, you know, like for a moment, like I just forgot this, this camera, this mic. It was just me and you having this conversation. And I, and I really love when podcasts turn out to be that way. I might not come off as the most professional person because this is how I am with everyone, you know? <laughs> That's just how I love to be. So It's the way yeah. I think we're all meant to be deep down, you know? So how do people find you? So you urge Arjun underscore teachings? I'm on... Yes, Arjun teachings. On Instagram. Is there anywhere else where people can connect with you? That's it so far because I'm kind of striking to keep my social media in one area. There's a lot of bad rabbit holes in social media I try to avoid. And so far with Instagram, I've made it a higher vibration, more positive environment. And I want to maintain that when I'm giving information and energy, you know? Yes. I think about doing YouTube eventually on guided meditations again. <laughs> okay. Oh, you do have a YouTube channel? I'm considering it, yeah. You know what? You should have a podcast. No, I am. Yeah, for real like either you can do it for yourself or you can have guests or you can just talk about it. so whatever you talk about right like let's say this is a shiva story that you want to talk about and what it could mean to us like practically you can just have a podcast man and uh that sounds cool <laughs> i do enjoy hearing myself talk for some weird reason <laughs> <laughs> You know what? That's a really, really great gift to have and you should make, you make use of it. I think there's only 0.0000001% of people in the entire world who like listening to them. And uh, you're one of them. So you should consider starting a podcast and you can have conversations there as well. So, yes. Thank you once again for being here. It was lovely talking to you. I really appreciate this. This was a very fun conversation to have. I really enjoyed it. And I'm sure I we will have this conversation again and we'll have you back again. So I will enjoy it. Yes. Thank you so much. <laughs> this podcast is now recorded on video as well as audio. If you want to look at me, then you can head to YouTube. If you want to just listen to me while you're driving to office or so while you're hit at the gym, then you can head to the audio streaming platforms like Spotify, Geo7, Ghana, Apple Podcast and Google Podcast. Oof, yeah, I got all of them right. So, ladies and gentlemen, hope you guys had as much fun as I did have like talking to Arjun. So, please show some love. See you guys next time. Until then, take care, spread love, take care of yourself especially. <laughs>